share something with you because this is big with me because I'm a convert. How many converts we got in here? Yay! Yay! I'll tell you something. If these Catholics don't look out, us converts are going to take this place over. <laughs> How about it? And I want to tell you that um, when you have not been raised with it and you find all of the riches of the faith, you get on fire with it. Some of you um, uh, probably have, uh, uh, this lady here said, we watch your tape all the time. Do you want to do it? Uh, you? <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, uh, like I said, I, um, I'm a convert. Uh, my mother was originally Baptist. My father was Lutheran. And at the age of 12, they decided to baptize me an Episcopalian. <laughs> now, here was a family who was not going to miss out on a technicality, huh? <laughs> but um, as I got on, I wanted to get into broadcasting. And when I got into broadcasting, I got a whole new religion. And uh, it was money. And I got into uh, broadcasting and uh, actually radio broadcasting. And um, <clears throat> so they say, if you want to make the Lord laugh, tell him your plans, right? You know, make a la lady laugh. I, I, and I thought that um, when I got into broadcasting, I was doing it for my greater glory. And the Lord just kind of, and Our Lady said, no, you're going to do this now for my greater glory. And that's as you see us here with the focus group. So <clears throat> what happened was, I had worked pretty much in every capacity in broadcasting, and I got into one of owning my own station. So I got a partner, and we looked around, and I, I'm from, uh, I, I'm born in Pennsylvania, but been in Louisiana long enough to say I, I'm, I'm, I'm from down there. And I met up with a partner, and we looked all around to buy a radio station close in New Orleans, but we couldn't afford one, so we bought two in Mississippi. Now, let me just say, to buy these radio stations, we were highly leveraged. But they say, you know, no risk, no reward. You know, when the apple go out on the limb, well, I, was, I was out there. And <clears throat> I had bought, I, I was very caught up in material things. And, and I, I like to say, when I was running with the devil, the devil was pretty good to me. You know why? Because when you have material things, you don't have time to think about God. And material things actually take you away from God. So I was... <clears throat> That God was something you, you thought about when you got old or something, you know. So <clears throat> I had this uh, radio station. It was uh, two, the two of them. Everything we had was, was uh, riding on this, the success of this. And it was on Halloween night. I don't do Halloween anymore. It was on Halloween night uh, in 1986. And I had a farm. And I had horses, a very nice horse farm. And we decided to have a big party. And I was entertaining some guests from South Central Bell. Because in broadcasting, as you may know, we, you use a lot of the phone lines. And so I was trying to put on the dog with the phone company and, and, and uh, wine and dine them. And so we decided to take them on a nice big hay ride out through the country and around my property. And as we were going down these country roads, all of a sudden, we were way back, we're all having a good time, and we're laughing and drinking and having a ball, and it was the hayride, there was a tractor and a trailer, and there's about 18 of us on this trailer. And as we're riding through there, all of a sudden, somebody said, there looks like there's a fire coming from your barn. And I looked over, and indeed, it did look like it was coming from my barn. So not one to ruin a good time, everybody else was saying, nah, now that's somebody's bonfire, it's not. And all of a sudden, I looked, and I said, the more I looked at it, the more indeed it did look like it was coming from my barn. And so I looked around on this trailer, this tractor, and you know, like with 18 of them on us and everything, it was like going so slow that I thought I could probably run faster than this old tractor can pull us there. And <clears throat> so I, in an anxious moment, I thought, because I looked around, I said, well, nobody will know like how to call the, the fire department. Nobody knows the place like I know the place, so I need to get back there, and I could probably run this faster than this old tractor can. So I got over to the corner of the trailer, and I jumped. And when I jumped, I didn't fall, but I couldn't get out of the way fast enough, so the wheels of the trailer caught me, knocked me down, and ran over me, and then pinned me under there and drug me about 20 feet. Now, I'm pinned under there and being drugged, and everybody now that's on the trailer of this sees this, and they begin to holler to the truck, to the tractor driver, stop, stop, stop. About this time, he realizes that it is the barn that's on fire. 
and he's wondering why would anybody want to stop and he's going as faster as that old tractor would take him and I'm being drugged under there and everybody keeps hollering stop stop and finally he turns around and he looks and he sees that I'm pinned under there and he becomes confused and in an effort to free me he throws it into reverse and backs back over me. Well, when he did finally stop, I slithered like a snake and got off to the side. And like I said, it was Halloween night. And I mean, well, they couldn't, they, they couldn't, we couldn't get an ambulance. This is kind of rural. It was out, you know, much like we're out here. And uh, we couldn't get an ambulance. And it was a hard time getting the fire department. And I laid in the road for uh, over two hours. And finally, we never did get an ambulance. And somebody had one of the cars with a seat would lay all the way down. So they said, well, let's put you in that and rush you to the hospital. So they do. And when they bring me to the hospital, they rush me in. And of course, now I've laid in the road for a couple hours. And they come and they take the x-rays. And they come out and they said, well, <clears throat> we have some bad news is that we're going to have to amputate your leg. And I said, well, I'd like a second opinion. <laughs> That's Let's get a second opinion, huh? You know? And they said, well, you see, you've laid in the road too long, and we're not getting a pulse in your foot. And it's, it's totally crushed. Your ankle's totally crushed. Your tibia's broken twice. Your fibula's broken twice. And um, there's no pulse. And I said, well, I still want to get a second opinion, you know? And like I said, this was rural, and so I thought I had a better shot if I'd go into New Orleans and get a bigger hospital there. So they said, oh, I don't think you'll be able to make it. Make a long story short, we make it. We get to the other hospital and those doctors look and they come out and they say it's good news and bad news. The bad news is, quote, it's one of the worst breaks we've ever seen. They, the tibia and the fibia and your ankle are so shattered that we can't put a pin. There's nothing to put a plate in. There's nothing to put a pin or screw in it. It's shattered. But we are getting a faint pulse. And we think that if we can just kind of line this up that eventually maybe we can get you into a something like a, a polio brace and uh, well that was good enough for me it was like look I don't care if I gotta take this leg and tie it to a skateboard and drag it just don't cut it off that's how that's how vain I am you know I'm like just that that's good enough that sounded great to me I'll drag the leg because all I can think about is everything I own is riding on these two radio stations I've mortgaged every piece of property I had like I said I was highly leveraged so everything I owned was riding on this. So this is a long process and they would do adjustments and they had told me that I was going to have to have all this physical therapy and this was a long road ahead of me and I began to sink very very deep into depression and I could see no way out of it. I had no money. Now I had a business partner that went in with me and as you know if you have a business you can't really draw a big salary from it so we're going to try to make it on his salary and two weeks after this happens to me, he's out walking his Doberman Pinscher. He trips in the road, in the, on the sidewalk, pulls all the ligaments in his leg, and ends up in the same hospital. Now, we don't have any money coming in. And there's no way out of this. And I truly have to tell you, I began to think seriously about suicide. I could just see no way out of this. Because every time I lay there, and the phone would ring, and it would be bill collectors. And it would be, you know... Discover, and I want to tell you this, you know, I, I, and I had all the credit cards, you know, I had them gold, I had them platinum, every color that they come in, I had them. And I want to tell you this, if ever in your life you feel that nobody cares or you, if you live or die, miss one credit card payment. <laughs> <laughs> miss one credit card payment. Be old, they care. <laughs> Believe me, they care. I just have to tell you this. This is a true story. One time they call up and all the, all the, you know, all the terrible things they're going to do to me and everything. And they tell me how far I'm behind and this and that. So I had it. And I said, and they said, Miss Vance, and, this, and I said, look, let me tell you what I'm going to do. When I get off this phone with you, I'm sitting here with all these drugs and I'm going to take all of these drugs and I'm going to commit suicide. Now that's what I'm going to do. And they said, oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe you could send us $50. <laughs> <laughs> true. True? So, now, I had a good cradle Catholic friend. And about this time, this is 86, Medjugorje, thanks to 
a journalist by the name of Mary Lou McCall had gone over and had done a story on it and it had sent like tens of, you know, thousands of people flocking over to Medjugorje. And all of a sudden, Marian devotions are popping up in all these churches. And the people were doing Marian devotions, they were praying the rosary, and then different people would get up and talk about that they had gone to Medjugorje, and they would start talking about, you know, all these wonderful things about Medjugorje. And she came over to me, and she said, I want to tell you about this place, you know, Medjugorje. And she started telling me about it, and how all these people who went over there, you know, all the things that never mattered, suddenly mattered, you know, and, all the, and, and, and how their whole lives were turned around and everything. And I said, well, look, I'm real happy for these people. <laughs> you know? But what does this have to do with me? And she says, if it is God's will for you to lose everything, I want you to have the grace to accept it. <laughs> well, in that special, <laughs> thanks, but no thanks, you know? So she said, well, I just wanted to tell you that these people, you know, they're, they're not into that anymore. And, and, and the things that didn't, didn't matter, now they matter. And all those material things don't matter. And I said, well, that's very good. And I'm real happy for them. She says, well, I was going to offer you a trip to Medjugorje. So why would I want to go to Medjugorje? <laughs> if I could go anywhere, I want to go to Mississippi and run my business. I don't want to go to Medjugorje. And she said, well, OK, fine. <laughs> so I lay there, and every day the phone rang. And it's bill collectors. Every day. Every time the phone rang, it was something about money. It was either something about money with the station, or something about it was like a foreclosure on a piece of property, or it was this, it was that. It was money. When that phone rang, it was money. And then she would come over and she would drop these little tidbits about how rural Medjugorje was, you know. So rural you had to bring your own toilet paper. <laughs> and she would drop these little tidbits about it and I picked up on one thing. She said it was so rural there was not even any phones in Medjugorje. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what a great place to hide out! <laughs> Yugoslavia? They'll never find me there! <laughs> so I say, next e evening she, when she asked me, she says, I said, she came over and I said, um, say, does your offer still stand? And all of a sudden she thinks, I've been called. <laughs> and she said, well, yes. You mean you want to go? I said, oh yeah, I want to go. Oh, yeah. She said, well, okay, well, we'll have to take you to the doctor and see what the doctor says and everything. Now, let me go back. Remember, I'm an only child. And so my mother, who had saw me in so much depression, and anything if I would not commit suicide, that if my mother thought she could call up John Glenn and get me a ride to the moon and it would pull me out of depression, she'd do it. So even though she never heard about that or anything, if she thought that was going to help me, okay. So she goes with me to the doctor, so J Janie says, well, you'll have to go to the doctor and see what the doctor says. So I go in and I tell the doctor that I would like to go to Medjugorje. And he said, where? <laughs> Why? I said, look, they got this place that they're selling peace. <laughs> and if there's a place on this earth that you can buy peace, I'm going to get it. <laughs> and he said, well, let's take a look at your x-rays first. So they take me back there and they x-ray my leg and he comes back and he said, look, let me show you this. And he grabbed like the bottom part of my ankle and grabbed the top part of my calf and he went like this. He said, you see this? He said, you've been all these months in a cast already. He says, and I heard about that place. I think Dr. Sopolo's wife or something went there and that's very rugged ter terrain. And if you make one wrong step, you're gonna be back crying in your beer and everything. I don't think, and I said, look, I gotta tell you something. I got to get out of Dodge. I wanna go. I got to go to Medjugorje. And my mother's saying, please doctor, if you think it'll help her mind, you know, <laughs> please, anything. <clears throat> so he says, okay. He says, well, how long would you be gone? I said, I don't know, something like 10 days, you know. He said, well, okay. He says, well, I'll tell you what I could do. I could put her in an extra heavy duty cast. Oh, that's good enough for me, good enough. So they put me in this extra duty cast and I called Janie and I said, guess what, I can go. 
And she said, okay, well, we don't want to take you on the 24th and the 25th. We don't want to go there because that's the anniversary and there'll be far too many people. Well, you can guess how Our Lady works. The trip we originally scheduled on got canceled and we end up going on the 24th. We end up going for the anniversary. So now I'm in this big, ever heavy duty cast and I'm forgetting about like all this, you know, it's going to be all this, uh, 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 all this travel and it's, and it's going to be uh, getting on and off of planes and I'm not really thinking about this because all I can think about is that I've been depressed and, and I wouldn't tell anybody where I was going. I would say, well, I'm going to Europe. <laughs> I wouldn't dare say where I was going. I would just say, well, I'm going to Europe, you know. And then I would talk to myself and say, well, you know, you deserve this. You're so depressed and this is, this will be good for you. And, and, you know, you've never been to Europe. When will you ever get a free trip to Europe again? You know, so I had myself all talked into it and I knew it was rural. And she had told me all about that. And she said, you know, there's no hotels. You're going to stay in people's homes. So I figured they were probably going to be like little chalets <laughs> that were going to overlook the sea, you know? And I said, well, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good about this. So, okay. So we get on the plane and at that particular time they were loading the plane through the rear and I had this big cast and I'd have to climb up the, on the plane and I'd sit down and whoever sat in front of me invariably would push the seat all the way back, you know, and it's so just be crammed up in here. Well, let me just tell you, by the time I get off that plane, I'm in a real good mood. And then they spring this on you. Now we're going to take a bus ride for about two hours, but it's beautiful scenery. So, okay, now I get on the bus. I'm not Catholic. <laughs> and somebody on that bus said, let's pray the rosary. <laughs> well, it was like the Energizer Bunny. It kept going and going and going and going. And now I'm thinking I just went off the bus. <laughs> well, let me tell you. When we finally pull into Medjugorje, I knew the rosary. <laughs> I knew it. I get off the bus. Now I just went off this bus. Now, I have to tell you this. Most of my years in radio had been kind of like you know, rock and roll, OK? Now, I have never really seen anything like this. Think of this. This is the anniversary. This is in 87. This is the heyday of Medjugorje. There are people everywhere. And the only way I can tell you that I thought this looked like Woodstock for Catholics. <laughs> there were people everywhere. And now I get out the bus, and here's this church, and it has outside speakers. And now the rosary is coming out <laughs> in a hundred languages. <laughs> I get off this bus. Now there's people who they pray. You know, got the church faces. You know what church faces? And they're on their knees, and there's a big cross over there in the back, and they were, oh, they were praying to the cross. They had chairs lined up, and they had people going to confession in all, all languages. They'd have it marked, you know, French and Spanish and all this kind of stuff. People were lining up in the hot sun. Oh, oh they're going to go to confession. And I looked around, and I got to tell you, I mean, it looked like to me somebody, it looked like somebody said, the world will end in 20 minutes. <laughs> This was absolutely the most depressing thing I had ever seen. And I'm already depressed. And I start looking at my friend, I said, this is it. This is where we're gonna be for 10 days? Where's the beach? Oh, I never saw anything like this. I couldn't believe it. And I'm hard. And I have to tell you, I'm saying to my friends, I hate this place. I hate this place. And I, I got to be the only one in Medjugorje. How I hate it. I had to look possessed. <laughs> so my friends say, take her behind the church. Take her behind the church. Okay. So they get me behind the church and they said, well, wait back there and then your tour director's going to come and they're going to put you in what house you're going to. And I'm walking back there and I'm going, I can't believe this. 
This is the most depressing. I'm already depressed. We're going to be here 10 days. And I go, shh, shh, come on, come on, come on. So we go in the back. And so now traveling with Janie and is um, one of her childhood friends that she made her first communion with and everything. And she is a school teacher. And I think she teaches like third grade. So she's just a little bratty kids that are hollering like me, you know? So she looks down at me. She says, you want to see some souvenirs? <laughs> So I'm like, yeah, anything, you know? So about this time, they had a little, uh, like a little trailer at that time over there, opened up with all kinds of souvenirs, and I start walking over to it with this big old cast on my leg, so I start trying to get over to it, and I'm walking over there. Before I can get to that trailer, they got about 80 people standing in a circle looking up. So I start looking up, and all of a sudden I see this disc spinning, and colors coming out, and it's pulsating, and all these colors come out, and I said to Ann, what's that? <laughs> well, before she can answer, this woman turns around and she goes, that is the miracle of the sun. <laughs> like she yells at me, you know? <laughs> well, she started it. So I say back to her, Get real, lady. That can't be the sun. If it was the sun, you couldn't look at it. There is a miracle of the sun. <laughs> well, so I said, Ann, I'm in broadcast. They got all kind of things. They got lasers. Somebody's shooting up a laser here or something like that. They said, shh, shh, shh. And then Ann's like, well, if this helping these people, and they think, I said, oh, come on, Ann, come on. So then all of a sudden, here comes... Uh, the tour director, and, you know, and they can't get me out of there fast enough, you know. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We found your house. We found your house. Okay, well, I guess this is where the piece starts, huh? <laughs> you going in a house, one bathroom? <laughs> Let's not go there. So anyway, next day we get up. Where are you going to go? Church. <laughs> so they line us all up, and they put the little name tags on, like we're kids, and we take us down to the church, and we go to church, and then they said, after that, we're going to go climb the hill. <laughs> of apparition. Okay. Well, now, this is how you got to go. You got to go in a group, see? So they say, okay, we're going to wait now. We're going to climb this hill. We got to go together. Okay, by the time we find T.T., Tata, Harry, and Mary, you know, <laughs> it's 12 o'clock and it's hot. So we start climbing this hill at, at noon. This is June. It's hot. And I'm going up this hill going, what? In, this is the stupidest thing I ever thought of. I don't know why I'm going up and all them other people going up. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk to me. You know. <laughs> so I say, oh, this is stupid. I'm going up here and take a look around. Oh, yeah, it's pretty scenery. I think I saw a little cafe down at the bottom. <laughs> I'm going down there and prop my foot up. I said, I'll see y'all. They said, well, we're going with you. So we go down to the little cafe. First, as soon as you can get that little cafe, I get there, I pull a chair, man, I prop that big cast up there. And the guy comes around and he says, Mary, this is tough. So he says, well, what do you want? And I said, <laughs> I want a beer. <laughs> and my two friends say, I have a Diet Coke. Well, I have a Diet Coke, you know. So, <clears throat> Now, you know, sooner bring the beer, and they bring the drinks like this, and here comes that tour leader. Hurry up now. Hurry up. I said, hurry up. She said, oh, yeah, hurry up. we got to climb the mountain. I said, oh, I just did that. <laughs> she said, oh, no, that wasn't the mountain. She said, that was the hill. <laughs> she said, the mountain is where Our Lady is going to appear tonight, and she's going to give a message to the whole world. I said, well, uh, you knew that this morning? <laughs> well, yes. I said, then why you got us climbing two hills, two mountains in one day? It's not like we're going to run out of fun things to do here. <laughs> Let's spread the action out a little bit, you know? This is like somebody, you know, they went to Disney World, they run and ride the Pirates of the Caribbean and, 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 and Space Mountain all in one day. Let's spread out the action. I said, well, I can tell you one thing. I am not climbing two mountains in one day. I said, you all go ahead. So then my friends start. Yeah. Well, I'll stay with her. No, I'll stay with her. No, you go. I'll stay with her. No, you stay. I'll stay. No, I'll stay. You stay. I'll stay. I said, look, 
you know, no one has to stay with me. I can stay by myself. They said, what are you going to do in Medjugorje by yourself? I said, I'm going to sit right here, drink beer, watch y'all climb the mountain, and knock yourself out. <laughs> knock yourself out. I said, are you sure? I said, yeah, go ahead. And when we got to hurry up, we got to get a backpack, got to get our canteens, got to get all, you know, got to get all the stuff, the flashlight, that, that. So I said, okay. So then they got up and they got ready to leave. And I thought to myself, you know, <clears throat> I thought I saw another little cafe a little bit closer to that big mountain that they were going to be climbing that night. And I said, I could probably get a better view if I go to this other place. So they had started out. And of course, those of you who have been to Medjugorje know the, the roads are, are, are dirt roads. And they were at that time narrow and the cars just keep flying by. And so everybody's kind of walking single file along the road. And as I begin to walk along the road, they're way ahead of me. They're going fast. And I got that big cast, you know. And the heat's coming down. And to tell you the truth, I don't know what is the heat or the beer. But something said to me, you know, it'll be just your luck. And something big's going to happen up there. And you're going to miss it. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I said to my friend, Sam, I'm going with you. I'm going up on that mountain. And, oh, no, your foot's too swollen. Oh, no, man, I'm going. Good thing I was nosy. <laughs> so I get back to the house, and um, they said, well, maybe we can catch you a cab. Now, this is the anniversary, OK? So <clears throat> they were running cabs. Uh, everybody was like going that way. So we said, well, it may, there's no cabs. We can't catch a cab. It's so crowded. So they said, well, maybe if we start walking towards the mountain, we'll catch somebody coming back and we'll catch that cab as, as it's coming back from that. So we begin to walk along going this way towards the mountain. Of course, they're walking fast, and I'm walking along like this. And man, those cabs are passing us up like dirty laundry. Nobody looking, zoom, 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 zoom. And we just keep walking. And then all of a sudden, this one cab, he does come up. And you know how your eyes will lock with somebody? We just, our eyes met, and he stops. And he had a fare in the cab. He already had somebody in the cab, and he said something to her, and she, he, she got out. And then he looks at me, and he says, and um, I said to my friends, I said, say, listen, he just said that the base of the mountain, the police have blocked off. But he knows another way around it. And he's done. Like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And then Ann, the school teacher, comes back and says, Char, how did you know that? And that's when it dawned on me. It was like, well, how did I know that, you know? So all of a sudden, they think I'm fluent. And they say, well, if you said you're doing so good, ask him how much, you know? <laughs> so he tells us, and we get in the cab. He says, $5 is a good deal. We all get in the cab. And all three of us are in the back. And all of a sudden, the mountain's that way. And he starts going that way. <laughs> and he puts in a cassette. And this rock music comes out. And he looks in the rearview mirror, and he goes, ha, 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 American music. And I thought, oh, glory be to God, don't let us be the only three women that come over here and something bad happened to us. I think that's what he said, you know? And sure enough, he did. He went around the back of the mountain, and the police did. This was still time. Back then, there were trills were still trying to discourage people to go up the mountain, and they did have it blocked off. And he knew it like, now, he did not bring me up the mountain, but he came around another way, and he dropped us off, and it wasn't too far from where the first station was. Well, those of you who have been there, that big mountain's deceiving. The hill starts out like this, Rocky, but this one kind of goes around like that, so it kind of looks a little easier. Now, so I get out, and oh, man, so many people are going up on this mountain. And I mean, they're going up, and they were carrying some, some handicapped people up there. They were going up barefooted. They were going up, uh, uh, they're, and they're carrying them, and, and they go up on their knees, and they're barefoot. And I thought, oh, my word, look at these people. And this is where I have to make a confession to you. You know, people, and maybe you've heard these stories, people were running around with their rosaries, and a lot of their rosaries were turning to gold. I don't mean 14 karat, but they were turning gold color. And everybody, it was happening all in the house that I was staying at. It happened with my friend Ann. It was happening with everybody. Everybody was running around, look at my rosary, look at my rosary. So at night after everybody finished up, I would go into the bathroom, and I would go up to the medicine cabinet, and I would take my nose, and I'd look at the hairs in my nose like that, see? because I was convinced they were spraying something in the air. <laughs> and if I would breathe it, it would stick to the hairs of my nose, and I'd figure this whole thing out. <laughs> this is how lost I am. So <clears throat> I start going up there, and I'm really taken 
by the sight of other people's faith. And I look at these people and I think, my word, what kind of faith must these people have to climb like this, to come all this way? And they're praying and they're going up on their knees and they're going up barefoot and they're carrying sick ones up there. And so I began to go up and, and I said, look, to my friends, I'll go as far as I can go. And if I can't go anymore, I'll just sit and wait for you to come back down. And as I began to go up there, I felt so touched by seeing these other people's faith. And then I, it came to me and I said, I know what's wrong with you. You don't have any faith. And I thought, if I only had one ounce of the faith that these people have. So I wanted to pray, but I didn't know a lot of prayers. Oh, I knew, you know, now he lay me down to sleep. I knew the blessing. I knew the Lord's prayer. But you see, that's the most wonderful thing you Catholics have. You have prayers for everything. You know, you lost something, you got St. Anthony, you got department heads. You got St. Anthony, you got bad eyes, you got St. Lucy, you want to sell a house, you got the, co you know, whatever you need. You got a department head, you got a ready prayer. Wonderful. The faith is rich in this. But I didn't have any prayers. But I knew that I was all messed up in my head. And I wanted to pray. So when I get up to about the third station, I say, simply, but very sincerely, dear God, heal my head. Because this is where I was thinking all these things, and I didn't have any faith, and I just, dear God, heal my head. And I go on. Now we get to the fourth station, and I like this, it's where Jesus meets his mother. And my friends say, let's take a break. Well, I was like, oh, God, yes, let's take a break. So I see this um, big rock, and I start backing up to it because I want to prop up my, my cast. You know? So here I am with this big cast and this broken leg propped up, up, up on this boulder. And here comes this monk. And he's got on a white robe, and he's got the hood up, and he's carrying a tripod with nothing on it, no camera. <laughs> and he's looking directly at me, and he's coming towards me. And he says, you know, when I was in Germany, I had the good for... I turn around and I thought, who's this guy starting in the middle of a conversation? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you do meet all kinds, you know, up here. <laughs> so I'm like this, and I think, he can't be talking to me. And he's looking directly at me. He says, you know, when I was in Germany, I had the good fortune of meeting Teresa Newman. I was like... It was this guy. You know, it was like saying I met John Jones or something. I'm like, yeah? You know, and he says, well, you know who that is, don't you? And I'm like, no. Nope. And he says, well, she was a stigmatist. Got me again. <laughs> and he says, don't you know what a stigmatist is? Uh-uh. He said, well, a stigmatist is someone who has received the wounds of Christ. Got me again. Never heard of such a thing. So I'm like, yeah? And he said, and when I was in Germany, I had the good fortune. And he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out his rosary. And he says, not this rosary, his rosary. He pulls it out, and he takes the crucifix, and he said, and I had the good fortune of laying it on one of her stigmatas. And ever since then, it's healed many people. Some of cancer, some of this, some of that. And he starts naming all these wonderful things. Now, here I am with this big cast on this rock, like this. He says, and I would like your permission to put this on your head. <laughs> well, you could have went, and I would have went off the side of the mountain. <laughs> so I started thinking, wait a minute. Now, this is true. This is exactly what happens to you. When something like this happens, I said, somebody is tapped into your thoughts. <laughs> you better start thinking some holy, pious thoughts quick. And then I started thinking, what's a holy pious thought? What's a holy pious thought? You know, what can I think? So, now Janie hates me to tell you this, but she's behind that boulder smoking. <laughs> and all of a sudden when she hears this, she pops out and she says, not her head, man, put it on her leg. Put it on her leg, man, it's her leg. 
then he kind of looks over at her and he goes, you know, with that look of ye of little faith, you know. So he does, and he places it on, on there. But he said, and I can't, I can't move because my, my prayer was my head. And then he says, now here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to say seven Our Fathers, seven Hail Marys, seven Glory Bees. And when you get up to the top with your friends, say the creed. No problem. I knew the rosary. <laughs> a little shaky on the creed, but I had the rosary. So I start watching. I'm like, oh, okay. And he put it on my head, and he goes on his way. Now, this guy, when he leaves, he would, like, walk up to somebody else, and he'd start talking French before you'd even heard him speak, and you'd be French. And then he'd go over here, and he might come up to you, and he'd start talking Spanish, and you'd be Spanish. He was like he knew what you were before he came. But when he spoke to me, he spoke in perfect English. I was like, I'm going to watch this guy. So I try to watch him, and he goes on his way. And we get up to about to the seventh station now. And I see him, and he's kind of winded. And he's kind of got that tripod, and he's kind of winded. And where I got the courage, I don't know, I walk over to him, and I take my canteen, and I said, would you like a drink of water? And he takes the lid off of the canteen, and doesn't say a word, never takes his eyes off me, drinks the water. He puts the top on, and he smiles a smile that went all the way through me. And then he took off. I said, when I get to the top, I'm looking for him. Now, we get up to the top. Now, it is packed. All of the people are pushing and shoving and trying to get as close as they can to the big cross, because that's where the visionaries are going to be. And they're trying to push and shove and get close. Now, I want to get as far back from that as I possibly can. And I have to tell you this, it's a carryover from my rock and roll days of like when they get up in that stadium and they start shaking that stadium and everything, I'm scared, you know, and they get all hysteria and everything. So I begin to pray this prayer. Dear Blessed Mother, please don't show yourself tonight. <laughs> please. Because if one of these nuts think they see something, we're all going off this mountain. Let me be one of those people that has not seen yet believe. I don't want to see nothing. <laughs> and I can't, I can't get back far enough. I don't want to see anything. And the people keep pushing forward. They keep pushing forward. And then all of a sudden, it got as quiet. And let me tell you this. Now we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, and we're waiting. It's more people piling up. I have to tell you this. Remember I told you it was blocked off? All of a sudden, these helicopters started circling the mountain. And people going, oh. And I said, oh, man, I bet you that's them commies, and they're just going to go, ah, 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 and make an example of us, you know? And that good cradle Catholic goes, oh, but what a way to go. I'm like, are these Catholic nuts or what? You know? So we're up there, and all of a sudden it gets quiet, 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 quiet. And I have to tell you this. I don't always say this, but I'm going to tell you this, because I think we're all called here for a special reason. And all of a sudden... That cross lit up, and it lit up, the best way I can describe it, like, a, um, like those old strobe lights, quick. And it's, now, traveling with me is Anne. Now, I have, what I didn't tell you about Anne, Anne is legally blind in one eye, and the other eye ain't too hot. Okay. And Anne's standing behind me, and Janie's over here, and some other people over here, and all of a sudden, that cross lights up. And I see Jesus on the cross. And I see him like I've never seen any kind of crucifix yet or since. Um, he looked horrible, horrible. He was terribly scourged. His nose was laying over. But the thing that got me is that he had this enormous, like, not this little, uh, little crown that you see, maybe three or four woven things. This thing was like a big bird's nest. It was a whole hat that was on his head. And it lit up, and I saw it, and then that quick... It lit up again, and I saw it, and I, all of a sudden, I hear Anne lean forward in my ear, and she said, did you just see Christ on that cross? And I thought, glory be to God, if she saw it with them bad eyes, I saw it! <laughs> I saw it, you know? So I look over at, at Janie, and Janie said, yes, yes, and she's crying, and then this other man, he grabs me, and he sees it, and these other people grab it, and then these people are like standing, the other people on the perimeter are like, what are you talking about? We didn't see that. And it was like it was just for a certain amount of people, and they saw it. And one of the guys that was with us, he ran directly to the, to the cross, and we stayed back. Now, that quick, we looked three times, I saw it, it was over. 
Then the apparition was over, and all these people are rushing back down the mountain now. They're going to run back to the church because now they're going to give it to their uh, spiritual director. He's going to translate and give the message to the world. Well, now I can't get down off this mountain. This thing is like so slick. The dew has come in. The crowds are going fast. They're going on. And I said, I can't get down. So they said, well, that's all right. We'll spend the night up here. Now, we were by no means the only people that spent the night on that mountain. It was beautiful. The stars were out. But I have to tell you this. I have to take a minute and tell you this, because this is like a miracle to me. Do you know that nobody had to go to the bathroom up there? <laughs> All night. And I was checking it out. You know, I was like, are they going behind the rocks or something? Nobody had to go to the bathroom. That's like a miracle to me. Now, when we get down the next morning, I got to go to the bathroom then, you know. So I get to the house, and I get to, into the bathroom. And I can only tell you that I felt totally zapped. It was like if you had ever been in a bad fog, and all of a sudden the fog lifted and you could see everything clearly. And I want to tell you this. I knew without a doubt, without a doubt, God existed and the Blessed Mother existed. And I just felt that she had taken me and said, come on, come on, you're going the wrong way. This is the way that she showed me to Jesus. So I come out of that bathroom, and I go up to my two friends, and I said, look, don't say nothing. But when I get back, I'm going to convert to Catholicism. <laughs> and he started crying. And I said, well, what are you crying? I thought you'd be happy. And they said, but that was our petition. That was our petition. So you see, I stand up here a product of someone else's faith. Every single one of you have somebody, somebody you're praying for. Don't give up. My God, if there was hope for me, there's hope for them. <laughs> and I stand here a product of other people's prayers. So now uh, uh, the days fast, fast, pass, and, we, and each day it sinks in a little bit more, and we get back. Now I get back, and all of a sudden I, like, I realize my whole, you know, you know like, what does this mean? It means your whole life is going to change. It's like I knew God existed. I knew my whole life was wrong. I had to straighten up, and I, and I was in the wrong lane, and I had to change lanes, and everything about it had to change. And as I get back, and the first thing I want to do is, like, I want to go back up. I want to, I want to sell my business. I just want to get out of all this. I'm not into material things anymore. I'm like them people. Everything that matter don't matter. Now it matters, matters, you know. I'm, like, I'm just like them people that I was happy for, you know. So I get back, and I got to go to the doctor. Now, my whole goal now is I want to just get this big, heavy cast off. And remember, I want to get into my brace. That's my whole goal, if I can get into the brace. So I go to the doctor, and my mother goes with me. And so now the same little x-ray technician has been taking these x-rays right along, OK? And so he knew that I was going over there. And he was taking the pre cana classes and everything. And he, you know, he said, uh, so we go in there, and he takes the, the x-rays. And you know, he says, well, how was your trip? Well, what do you say? <laughs> I saw Jesus. <laughs> So <clears throat> I say, oh, oh, it was wonderful, it was wonderful, wonderful. And he says, okay. So I said, well, we take these x-rays. Now go on into the casting room. We'll see if we can, uh, we'll probably have to put you in a lighter weight cast and then eventually get you into that. So go ahead on over. And when I go to go into that casting room, somebody was already getting a cast on the thing. So they said, well, go wait in that waiting room. And when I get in that waiting room, there's about 18 people sitting around. And I'm not in there very long. And all of a sudden, he comes running in with these x-rays. And he's got these x-rays like this. And he goes, Charlene Vance? You've been healed, you've been healed. <laughs> I'm going, you gotta see that happen in a waiting room. You gotta see it to believe it. Those people with those magazines, People Magazine. he mean you've been healed <laughs> the next thing I know the nurse runs in then all of a sudden here comes now when's the last time you saw this a doctor comes into the waiting room <laughs> and he says did you hear and, 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 and the nurse said did you hear about it and my mother said well what is it what is it and he goes well I don't know we're gonna go take a look it looks like this bone it was just like this bone growth and, and, and we're gonna go take a look right now now any other time and I've been in this cast 10 months they put me in that little, like, first you wait in this room, and then you wait in that little waiting room for like 45 minutes for him to grace you with his presence, you know. 
This time, he's coming in, he's sawing this baby off himself. <laughs> so he saws it off, he picks it up like this, and he says, now, now keep in mind, my ankles may crush, so they're not expecting any movement here, but he wants to see if I have any movement. He says, slowly try to see if you can move your toes. So my foot's up there, and I go, and I rotate my whole ankle. And he goes, wait a minute. Right, right there. And all of a sudden, I got, and I got excited, and then I got down, and I started dancing around. I said, Mom, Mom, look, I can walk. Praise God, I can walk, right? And so he runs out, and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he goes back, he brings this other doctor in, they bring the old x-rays, flip, 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 flip. They're looking, and they're looking at that. And my poor mother says, doctor, doctor, what is it? Direct quote. He said, there's absolutely no correlation in her x-rays before she went. And when she got back, there's total bone growth everywhere. And my mother said, Doctor, can this have anything to do with Medjugorje? <laughs> and he's like, oh, we can't explain it. So I had those medals, you know, from Medjugorje, and I run out in that waiting room, I start passing them out. Here, have a medal. <laughs> Here, have a medal. Have a medal. Have a medal. <laughs> so I jumped down. I'm walking all around. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're in shock. You're in shock. You're still going to need a crutch. You're still going to need a cast. You're still going to need uh, uh, therapy. You're going to need extensive therapy. Do you know I walked out of that doctor's office and I never went back? I never had one day of therapy. And I know there's some doctors here. You know what amazes every doctor the most? That I didn't have any muscle atrophy. How could you not have muscle atrophy? You've been in this cast 10 months. You have no muscle atrophy. And I walk out. Praise God. Do you know why I wanted to come here and tell you this today? Because Jesus Christ is the same as he was 2,003 years ago. Miracles do happen. Believe in miracles. Expect a miracle. Miracles do happen. Now I get back and I say, but don't tell nobody about it. <laughs> I don't want to tell anybody about it. They say, what do you mean you want to tell anybody? I said, well, you know, how can a miracle happen to me? I thought miracles only happened to really holy, pious people in the 16th century <laughs> in Europe. So I came back and the first thing, you know, I go around and Janie says to me, well, now you said you want to become a Catholic. So I go and I talk to this priest. And of course, he heard about it, and I was walking around, and everybody saw everything about this. And they said, So I go up to this priest and I said, Listen, I want to become a Catholic. And he said, Well, just because you had a miracle happen in your life, you don't have to become a Catholic. I'm like, What do you got to do to get in this clique? <laughs> a miracle's not good enough? <laughs> you sure named that program right when you call it the RCIA? It's like the CIA to get in. <laughs> but I did. And you know, it was very wise because what he wanted to explain to me was that miracles happen for everyone, huh? They happen to everyone. And then he wanted to teach me about the Catholic faith. And so he did, and he gave me private instruction. And I want to tell you, six months to the day that I climbed that mountain, I made my first communion. <laughs> A year and a half later, my mother made her first communion. <laughs> <clears throat> Praise God. Now, I want to tell you this. I will be eternally grateful that God healed my leg. But you know that's not the real miracle. The real miracle is when God healed my head with a gift of faith. That is the real miracle. And so you see, miracles do happen, but they happen in God's time and in his way, right? Amen? Amen. Now, I want to tell you, I'm out speaking at different churches now. People have seen it. And then somebody comes up to me. Now, I've never heard what, who, who was he said? Teresa Newman. I never heard of this, you know? So somebody says, hey, did you ever see this book? And I said, no. And it was like Miracles of the Eucharist or something. And they had like a little page and a half a page like that. And so I get the book. And I said, you ought to read it because it has something about Teresa Newman. Well, I had never heard anything about it. And that was since the monk. So I read it. And it says, Teresa Newman was injured. 
Uh, no, Teresa Newman was born on Friday, April 8th. That got my attention. I had been born on a Friday, April 8th. So Teresa Newman was injured and in trying to put out a fire in a barn. Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> she was injured. It was her ankle. And she was miraculously healed a year later. Do -do 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 -do. So I call up my then spiritual director and I said, hey, father, listen to this. And I read it to him, and I said, what do you think? He said, I think you ought to get another book. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And I became so enamored with it. If you know anything about her, she lived on the Eucharist for over 30 years. And I set out then to do a documentary. And the day I was out to California on filming a gentleman with her, who walks in but Noreen Vanswell? We never knew each other. And Noreen had had this great devotion because she, someone, her, her husband's aunt, had got to actually see Teresa Newman and all of going through, the, going through the passion, suffering the passion. And Teresa Newman gave uh, Noreen's husband's aunt her rosary beads, her actual rosary beads, not just a pair that she prayed over, but her beads that touched the stigmata that she prayed on. And so Noreen was so taken with that that Noreen wanted to know more about it. And so we hooked up and we began trying to start working to see if we could start in motion in the wheels, maybe the beatification of Teresa Newman's faith, because she got a hard way to go. She was a lay person and all of this kind of stuff. But she did wonderful things. And so we, we hope to be making a documentary and work together on that. And I want to tell you that Noreen has sent those rosary beads here. And they are here. And when we have our healing service, I will be praying. If you ask me if you want to be prayed over, I will pray over you with these rosary beads. I know Sandra has a rosanistic statue. Father has some stuff he'll be praying over with you. But I want you to know that miracles do happen. But they happen in God's way and his time. Thank you very much for being here. You are called. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.